What's good everybody, I'm Keandre, this is Super Intellect, and welcome back to the channel. Now there's a whole lot going on in this class right now from some of the injuries to the top players to a lot of the top teams in college basketball losing left and right, and even some players kind of starting to show uh, who's who, but I still imagine a lot of it is going to change over the next couple months. I do think that the top of this group is going to end up being the weakest that I have scouted to this point, but there are still a lot of potential contributors and after that rotation pieces throughout that get pretty difficult to rank at this moment. So I still think teams are going to get better through this draft. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and jump into it, starting with some of those right outside the top 60. It's been really difficult to narrow down as I've watched more, so I did want to quickly highlight a few here. I'm still undecided on AJ Johnson. He's been interesting with a little more opportunity since Justin Tatum got the job, but he's still a real work in progress. Oregon's Jackson Shellstad could be the next smaller guard to get on here. It probably makes most sense for him to stay in college as long as possible, but I think he's an eventual NBA talent, super dynamic with the ball, and I wouldn't rule out him being draftable this year. I haven't watched Hanson Young since this summer, but he's a really talented big out of China putting up numbers in the CBA, so that'll be high on my to-do list. Old Chamche is a wild card given he's barely eligible, but he's still an intriguing athletic big out of Cameroon. And then guys like Montez Rupstavich's, Milan Momchilovic, Walter Clayton, Dylan Mitchell, a Harrison Ingram, a Juan Nunez, and a few others are right there and really tough to pick between, but that's where we're at right now. Reese Beekman's lack of progression as a three-point shooter and pull-up score has stopped me from being higher on him. I love the defense and he's continued to grow as a passer and he seems to really make that team go in terms of leadership and just making plays, but I end up wanting a little more from him offensively. So he probably won't leave the board, but that's why he's here. Oklahoma's Otega Owe has been ridiculously efficient and productive for one of the most surprising teams in college this year. I know you'd be crazy to expect him to continue to shoot this well. I think he's draftable for his physical defense and playmaking and driving abilities. I'd be even higher on him if he shot more threes or was a bit more capable with the ball in his hands given his size, but I like him and think he's still a little undervalued in the grand scheme right now. It's almost impossible for Baba Miller to not have a real NBA interest as a 6'10", 6'11 wing with that level of fluidity and upside on both ends of the floor. And even though he hasn't stood out as much as you'd like, shot has been a little inconsistent and he's still under 50% from the free throw line. I still like him a decent amount long term and think he's draftable. It'll probably make sense for him to return if he stays at this level, but for now he stays on the board. The numbers haven't been as impressive lately, but I still think Jameer Watkins has the pieces as an NBA wing. He's physical, a big time defender, he can make plays for others, and as long as he can just tread water as a shooter and hopefully show a little more progress there along the way, I think he's got a chance to stick in the NBA eventually, so that keeps him here. Matthew Cleveland has been an impressive athlete and defender in his college career, but the improvements he's made across the board offensively and fitting right into this Miami system have made him a draftable player. He's become wildly more efficient from two, a legit threat from three, which was the opposite of the case in the past. And for those reasons and others, he's someone I think a team gives an opportunity to in the second round. I think Pacom Dadie will either rise this year or have the option to bet on himself and improve his stock a lot next year. He's an athletic wing with a ton of scoring flashes and it's likely a team will eventually take a chance on him and give him an opportunity given he's starting to produce more consistently in his minutes for Ohm. UConn's Alex Caravan just makes too much sense not to value somewhere in this big late first to mid second round group. He's a good shooter with size, he can make plays, and he's been better on defense than I've seen in the past. And he might even rise some more by the next boy that we put out. I really like his game and he's been such an important piece to this success. Just a big time player overall. I would understand if you're completely out on Justin Edwards and I wouldn't really argue, but I still think there's something there to at least take a flyer on. I want to see him really lock in defensively, bring energy on the glass and in transition all consistently. And hopefully some of the previous flashes of shot making and decision making continue to grow this year and in the future. And that'll at least make him someone with a little more substance on what should be a really good Kentucky team down the stretch. Kwame Evans Jr. has been really impressive as of late, playing a lot of five for Oregon with the injuries that they've had. He's been producing really well, especially on the defensive end. I still have a ton of questions about whether or not he can play the five in the NBA because that's where he's been at his best this season. And also if he can hold up as that forward slash wing in a lot of different ways, including the shooting. But the defensive activity, playmaking and movement are probably worthy of picking if he decides to be a one and done. 
Bronny James makes his first appearance on the board this year. Now, I know some of the initial reaction to this might be crazy, especially given the last couple games, but I think he's actually got a good chance to rise from here as he gets off the minutes restriction and back into full game shape. And also with Isaiah Collier being out for some extended time, I'd expect him to get more opportunity quickly. I think he's one of the better point of attack defenders in this class. He's one of the few plus athletes in this connective guard archetype, and he has a long track record as a great shooter, though he hasn't shot it well just yet. It is going to have to show itself more at some point this season to feel confident about it, but I look at De'Anthony Melton, the case in Wallace, the line right, even a Gabe Vincent last year. I think Bronny could provide similar value in the league, health willing. So that's the pitch. 14 points for Kobe. Short clock for Bronny. What a find. Morgan. Aaron Bradshaw remains a bit of a wild card in this class. His fourth quarter stretch in the last 10 minutes of the game against Florida were excellent on both ends, including a big three. And if he can bring more of that consistently, I think it'll bode well. He's still a bit limited physically and isn't particularly explosive, but the upside is a potential floor spacing five who moves well enough and can block shots is always intriguing. But what a great job to recover it. I really like PJ Hall's game despite being mostly locked into being a four in the NBA, not offering a ton of versatility there defensively. I do think he's gotten better on that end aside from the fouling that has to come down a little bit, not even a little bit, a lot, but his ability to stretch the floor, make a play off the bounce, score inside has been really impressive and made him an easy draftable prospect in my opinion. I probably wouldn't argue with someone having Tyler Kolek much higher than this. Love his competitiveness, he's a sound passer and pick and roll operator and a decent shooter, but the athletic limitations, questions on defense, and some of these games where he's just silent still kind of give me pause, but he's got a solid game and I really like what he brings to the table. Pella Larson has slowly started to convince me he can be an NBA contributor. He's high feel on the wing. He can attack a closeout and serve as a secondary ball handler. I've enjoyed watching him defend this year, especially in the Alabama game. And though he's not a great athlete and will need to take more threes eventually, I think he belongs on the board. Kylan Boswell continues to be a really solid complimentary card prospect. He's knocked down from three, he makes good decisions, and has had some truly ridiculous passes as of late. He did struggle a little more defensively than I expected early in the year, but I still think he projects really well there, and despite being smaller and having some questions in his ability to get downhill and make plays from there, he's a winning player, and we gotta remember that he doesn't turn 19 till April, so he's really just getting started. He has improved, but until Judah Mintz becomes a more willing and comfortable three-point shooter both off the catch and off the dribble, he's going to be somewhat limited at that size. Now, I love how often he gets to the paint and to the free throw line. He's a really solid playmaker and makes plays defensively, but the threes, rising turnovers, and struggles against some of the better guards he's played against this year do give me some pause, but I still like the positives that he brings to the game. Kyle's Jalen Tyson has quietly produced at an elite rate, putting up 21-7-3, and, and it gets him on the board for the first time. He's a 3-4 man who has done a lot of creating for them. He shot the ball well and made plays downhill, and I think he's interesting. He's not the greatest athlete, and I have had a few questions defensively, but the second half against Colorado felt like his big moment, and I think he climbs for his versatility and just all-around play. This USC team has struggled quite a bit and Kobe Johnson has had his share of those individually, but the case for him as a prospect is still intact. He's a very good defender on the wing and at the point of attack. He's a solid passer in multiple ways and if we can see the better version of him as a shooter and score consistently down the stretch, he'll probably be somewhere around the first round to the early second and, and USC will likely get more wins in the process given they've lost just one game this season when he scored in double figures. Only shooting 20% from three as Kobe Johnson gets downhill. I would take some responsibility for having too high of expectations for Tyrese Proctor, but he just hasn't been the type of shot maker and overall playmaker he showed signs of being at the end of last year. Now, I still think there's a player there if he can shoot it because he has good size. He can be a positive defender and still navigate a pick and roll well. But he's going to have to get going soon. Otherwise, he may very easily end up playing with Cooper Flagg and company next year. There's Proctor weaving into traffic. Spots up and hit. Zach Eady has quickly become one of the most polarizing prospects in the class with some ranking him as high as the lottery, which I do think is wild, but he has become a better prospect. 
He's a giant at 7'4", 300 pounds with a 7'10 wingspan, and he's been ridiculously productive and impactful on both ends, owning two of the 15 highest BPMs in college basketball since 2008. And most importantly, he's made strides as a mover, though it is still a bit of a question mark. I just have a hard time seeing him provide that lottery level of value as a sole drop big who we also haven't seen do much else offensively besides post up his entire career and that includes running the floor and rolling so again i do think he's gotten better and the size and productivity is undeniable but for right now i still think there are some valid reasons to be hesitant i'm not sure how kj simpson has been so quietly one of the best players in college basketball but that's kind of where we're at right now. He's been super efficient, playing on and off the ball, no slouch on defense, and he's kept this team afloat amidst all the injuries that they've had. Of course, he's a smaller guard and not a great athlete, and the NBA hesitancy makes sense in that respect, but he can absolutely go. And right now, I say he's draftable. I'm looking for a little more from Trevin Brazil as Arkansas gets into SEC play. I feel like the idea of him as a prospect isn't really going to change. You got a floor spacing 4 slash 5 who can provide help side rim protection and sky above the rim, but I just want to see him further assert himself on the offensive end and just be a little sharper all around down the stretch. Every time I rank Deron Holmes, I feel like it's a bit lower than it should be. He's shooting the three ball in a real way this year, doubling his career makes through 14 games. He's also been a bit better as a decision maker and giving himself more versatility beyond the interior scoring. He's also looked good defensively as of late, and though I think he can still get a little bit stronger, I'd be surprised if he doesn't continue to rise over the year. Not much has changed for Weber State's Dylan Jones. He hit a game winner against South Dakota State last week and continues to put up some of the most prolific all around numbers for any player I've scouted. And his ability to impact all facets of the game with solid wing size remains intriguing. I'm still not 100% sure where to rank him not knowing his role in the NBA but he's made improvements especially as a shooter and he just feels like someone that's gonna figure it out and belong in first round conversations. It's been good to see Hunter Salas continue to lead this Wake Forest team and play at the level he has as a high level scorer and tough defender as a two guard. If he continues playing like this I could see him getting interest as high as the first round especially if he can continue to grow as a passer. Now some of the plays that Dembona makes are as impressive as anybody in this class, especially the way he covers ground defensively. Almost might have been better for him to leave last year just so he didn't have to go through this season on this clunky roster and be a little bit overextended as an offensive player, but he still got appeal as a play finishing energy big who can clean up opportunities at the basket. BYU's Jackson Robinson has been one of the biggest risers on my board and for good reason. He's a 6'7 wing who was one of the better shooters in college and has some really impressive flashes off the bounce. Now I need to watch more to get a better gauge of who he is defensively. He is still a bit slim but I could see him continuing to rise if he keeps it up in Big 12 play. I feel like some of the early struggles against Colorado State and Loyola have stayed with Trey Alexander a little longer than they should, especially considering he's been most of what we expected in the other contests since. Now he hasn't shot it great this year overall, but he's got a great history of it and been hot recently. I like his growth as a ball handler and passer too, and, and even though there are some questions in his separation and just being a smaller off guard, to me he should still stick in first round combos. Providence's Devin Carter has been one of my favorites to watch to this point, and he's also gotten himself into first round contention for me as well. He's a dog of a perimeter defender, and he's been a much improved shooter in all ways, which has been the big key, and he's at least capable of making a play off the bounce for himself and his teammates. And right now, he should be one of the favorites for player of the year in the Big East. Pittsburgh's Bob Carrington has been pretty hard to rank, and I'm still deciding whether or not he's going to be a one and done for me. He's probably one of the best freshman shot makers I've scouted, and he's also a talented passer, but the issues in him as a driver and some of the decision making and strength make me think waiting a year could be in his best interest, but we'll see what happens over the rest of ACC play and go from there. Carrington likes the matchup. I believe UC Santa Barbara's AJ Mitchell has asserted himself as a potential first round pick early in the season and even though I really want him to shoot the three ball more than the two times a game he has for the past three seasons and he's also not the burstiest athlete or separator, his combination of craftiness, vision, and solid defense at that size make him a very appealing prospect the way he's been producing. It's been a somewhat disappointing year for DJ Wagner so far, but it's still early enough to have some hope in him turning it around. I still liked his ability to get to the paint and defend at the guard spot, 
the pull-up shooting and off-ball play just hasn't been quite where you'd want it for a young scoring guard. He has shown some needed improvement as a live dribble playmaker and gotten some shots to fall from three recently, but he'll need to show more to rise back up closer to where he was entering the year. I've been surprised that Ball hasn't really caught on more. He's an intriguing wing who can handle it and has been lights out from three and shown a ton as a shot maker. And in a never ending search for those dribble pass shoot wings, he's checking those boxes in some capacity and I think he's gonna be the third straight draft pick from Santa Clara. Wuga Poplar had been out for a few games with an ankle injury, but he's been playing his best basketball this year. He's shooting nearly 50-50-90 from the floor as a high-level athlete and a sound team defender, and the pull-up shooting growth has definitely stood out. I still want to see him get back to the rim a little more and, you know, make some plays for others given his size, but he's an obviously good player to me and will look to keep it going and lead this Miami team. Wuga Poplar. Jared McCain has definitely been Duke's best guard prospect and even though we can pick at the athleticism or just how much he can create as a guard that size, he's a lights out shooter, he's unselfish, he makes good decisions with the ball and has improved defensively from that shaky opening stretch. And for all that right now, I think he's a first round pick. I don't think we'll learn too much else about Oso Iguodaro at this point. He's been great over the last couple years and he'll likely go somewhere from 20 to the mid 30s in the draft as a tough nosed big who defends multiple positions, can make plays and be a really effective pick and roll partner and finisher there. He's a little undersized for what he does but I like what he brings to the table and I think he's going to play a big part in this Marquette team making a deep run. The Melvin Agenza resurgence has been very good to see. He was ice cold from the floor there for a while and I think he might just be a bit of a streaky player right now which is fine but he's a young pro contributing in a pretty good league and has shown a lot of positives as an athlete, defender, and shot maker on the wing. Dalton Connect had really slowed down after the ankle injury in big time game against UNC until his 28 point night against Mississippi State. But I still think he's a potential late first round pick. He's a talented shooter and scorer with good size. If he plays anything close to how he did the other night in the SEC, he'll most likely stick in this range. Bobby Clement has had some ups and downs this year, but I still think he's well in this mix as a big wing who can shoot it, make plays in the open floor, and has the tools to be solid defensively. It's got to be more consistent and better on that end, but given he's relatively young, producing in a pro league, there's more room for patience, and he wasn't capable of a lot of this a year ago this time. Tristan Da Silva has also missed some time with an ankle injury, but when he's out there, he's continued to be a solid all-around player and a model of consistency. There's very few holes in his game. He shot it better from two this year. He's expanded as a playmaker and taken more threes, and I think he'll end up going fairly high even with some of the athletic or defensive questions that might still remain. I think Ethan Almanza has become pretty underrated at this point. I still get the concerns of him being a full-time five at the NBA level, but he's getting better by the game and has at least made progress as a contributor offensively and just in his aggressiveness over the last month or so. The pitch with him is still a high-level versatile defender who can finish plays and just keep an offense moving as a playmaker, and I would still consider him in the first round. Kelo Ware hasn't quite put up the same numbers he had earlier in the season, but a 7-footer who's mobile, can protect the rim, and finish plays like he can still has appeal. I do wish he was in a little better situation offensively because he is relied on to do a whole lot, and it doesn't always go well with you know some of the post fades and everything, but he's still a solid first rounder to me who has brought some of the necessary improvements in his effort and understanding, though he still has some room to grow in that respect. You can still make the argument for Tyler Smith being Ignite's best performing prospect this season, but he's at least been the most consistent. He's made important improvements defensively, though there are still questions there, and he's handled playing the five fairly well, all things considered. He's still a bit of a tweener, and there's probably more need for him to shoot it well to be effective than you'd like, but I think he belongs here. Donovan Klingon is currently still out with a foot injury for the next couple weeks, but as he returns, he's still an intriguing option as a 7-2 big who protects the rim at a high level and can finish plays around it. Now, he hasn't moved as well as he did a year ago, and the fact that we've never seen him play 25 minutes consistently bothers me some, but I still think there's late lottery upside in what he brings to the table, and we'll see how the rest of the season goes for him.
I'm sold on Ryan Dunn being a potential elite NBA defender in multiple ways, but the big question remains in who he is offensively and where he makes an impact at the next level. He's shooting about 20% from three and he's nearly stopped taking them and is also in the 50s from the free throw line. Now I do like that he has found a way to produce as a play finisher and athlete, but it's probably not going to be available in the same way. Now this will probably all end up being irrelevant if he ends up in OKC or New Orleans and they get him right, but this is the big swing for him, even in determining where he gets picked. I struggle to find a long list of players I'd rather pick than Kansas' Kevin McCullough. He's always been an elite defensive wing prospect, but in taking on a huge offensive role this year, he's upped his percentages and volume as a three-point shooter, he shined even more as a passer, and he's given me a lot of confidence he'll be able to contribute in the league, even as a fifth-year senior. I recently got to see Eve Misi and Baylor against Oklahoma State, and he was as good as he's been all year in the second half of that one. Now, he followed that up with a rougher game against BYU, but all this stuff still remains. He's a very good athlete, he's active on the glass, he covers ground defensively, and you see what he did to a guy like Kyle Filipowski in their matchup. I just think he makes a lot of sense as a play finisher and defensive five, and he might just end up the best center outside of Alex Sar in this class. Stephon Castle might end up one of the hardest players to rank. He started to produce and make a positive impact, but the complete lack of perimeter scoring, shooting, and half-court offense struggles has completely changed who I thought he would be coming into the year. Now, the defense, the playmaking, and some of the ball handling upside on the wing keep him here, and I do still think there is more to him long-term, but it's hard to be super high on that type of player if they're not also drawing defense as a driver consistently or an elite athlete, so we'll see what he does as he gets fully healthy and acclimated. Solo now even with some of the athletic or role concerns that might be there, I'm pretty convinced Reed Shepard is going to find a way to be successful in the NBA. He's a very active defender, he's been a knockdown shooter and a solid playmaker in multiple ways, especially in transition, and just makes winning plays consistently. Now we can talk about upside and if he may be limited as a creator, but the feel, efficiency, and just all around production just make a lot of sense fairly high in this draft, somewhere between the late lotto to the late teens. More consistency and improved shooting has made me a bit more intrigued by Tijon Salon over the last month. He's an athletic 6'9 wing who is an active defender and potentially the youngest in the class. And while I still think he has a long ways to go as a decision maker and in his overall feel, he definitely has the pieces to make a big impact. I'm still not 100% tied to this. I do want to see a little more, but his tools are really compelling. I'm much higher on Kyle Filipowski than I have been in the past, and a lot of it is because of his improvement on defense. Now he's not elite or anything, but he's made real improvements as a mover in the pick and roll and executing their schemes, and when you add all that to the things that he does as a playmaking big who can score in a lot of ways and shoot it, he's got a good case. I still want to see him get high from three and be consistent, and I do have some positional questions, but I like what he's done so far and that gets him in my lottery. Isaiah Collier had a really bad December, but it looked like he might be heading in the right direction in the new year with zero turnovers against Cal and maybe his best game against Stanford with 26 points and three threes, but he suffered a hand injury against Washington State and will now be out for over a month. This is going to get really tricky whether he comes back or not. He's still a dynamic playmaking talent, but some of the questions he could potentially leave us with do make it tough to have him much higher than this right now, so I'm hoping for a speedy recovery for him. On to another Baylor guy in Jacoby Walter. I do like his game and his upside, but given his size as a smaller wing, I probably won't be top five high on him until he can either improve on what have been some serious struggles defensively or show more as a creator, which he has started to do both at the OSU game I saw and against BYU. He is one of the very best shooters here and does it in numerous ways and he at least has the tools both on and off the court to improve but that would be the reason why I'm not as high as some others on him right now. Rob Dillingham has been one of the most dynamic players in the class and despite being a smaller guard he's been good enough to have in his range which says a lot about what he's done. His combination of a great handle, electric pull up shooting, improved passing and fitting into a winning team setting has made him someone I think has a chance of making one of the biggest impacts in this class. Now there still are some obvious question marks and we talked about some of those in his first look video but he's in my top 10 at the moment. Dillingham. 
Colorado's Cody Williams recently returned from a wrist injury that's had him out for about a month, so he was a little rusty against Cal, but prior to that he'd been playing like a definite top 10 pick, and his combination of driving, playmaking, and upside as a defender and overall score on the wing is enticing. I think the shot will be watched close down the stretch and eventually he'll need to progress physically, but if he's anything like his brother, the leaps he can make as a player in the next 2-3 to three years could be very exciting. Modest Buzelis got off to a really good start after returning from injury, impacting the game in a number of ways, and he helped Ignite win after they were getting beat in the worst ways. Since then he's been far from perfect and struggled in some games, but he's been more aggressive lately, his help side rim protection has been one of the best developments I've seen from this team as a whole, and the appeal is still there with him as a big connective wing. Zachary Rizashe continues to be a really solid prospect and consistent producer, and I appreciate that given what some of the others have done. He's got legit wing size, he can really shoot it and makes a solid impact defensively. Now there are still questions in his ability to make decisions with the ball and finish, and I like what he does, and if he keeps improving physically over time, he'll surely contribute in the NBA. Now it might sound crazy looking at some of the numbers, but I still think Ron Holland is a potential top 5 guy in this class, and the main reason why is the progress that he's made as a player over the last year or so. He was basically more of an energy 4 man, and now he's shooting step backs and pull ups in the mid range, he's handling the ball and driving to the bucket at will, all at the G League level, and I think that means something. Now the results haven't always necessarily been good. I'm not going to sit here and say the shot and decision making haven't been real serious issues at times, but the idea that he's been this huge disappointment or should drop down to like 11, 12, 13, 14th in this draft is kind of wild to me. Now the further we go, I think it'll be fair to ask tougher questions this high in the draft and how he most easily contributes and fits in at the next level, but I'm still good with him towards the top for now. After a great start on loan with Mega Meese in the Adriatic League, Nikola Topic decided to go back to Red Star and play in the Euro League. He had some impressive flashes in that new situation already, but he did unfortunately suffer a knee injury in that second game and will be out for about 6 weeks, which sucks for a number of reasons. He'll likely still stick in the top 5-ish for the time being as a big playmaking Sorry. guard, and if he can return and play well, there is a path to him becoming the clear number 1 guy. And finally, Alex Saar remains the number one prospect on the board, and he has also caught the injury bug lately out for two to three weeks with a hip injury, but hopefully he'll be good to go as soon as possible. You guys know by now what he does, he's a big time defender with all the modern qualities you look for in a big, from rim protection to versatility and ground coverage, and he's also had some great offensive flashes and produced at a really high level considering the limited minutes that he's had. And I do still think there are some valid questions there with him, especially in that 4-5 stuff that we talked about, but I prefer his upside to most of the other options and think there's a clear path to him being a really valuable NBA player, even though there might not be any bona fide stars at the moment. And here's a look back at the entire top 60. I appreciate y'all for watching this video. If you enjoyed, please be sure to leave a like. Subscribe if you are new to the channel and leave a comment down below some of your thoughts on this class as a whole and also somebody you think is going to be a sleeper or maybe break out in this second half of the year. Now I do plan on doing a few more of those first look videos over the next week or so so stay on the lookout for those and then we'll probably get into another rookie watch at some point just talk about you know Chet and Wimby and how everybody else has been doing and yeah that's gonna do it as always I'm Keandre this is Super Elect until next time I'm out.